Hi, I'm Andrew Liang. Welcome to another installment of the Distinguished Speaker Series. Today we're joined in Washington, D.C. by Ken Duberstein, the chairman and CEO of the Duberstein Group and former White House Chief of Staff under President Ronald Reagan. His roles in a distinguished career of public service have included Deputy Chief of Staff and Assistant to the President for Legislative Affairs. Widely considered one of the most knowledgeable Chiefs of Staff and respected public servants of our time, we are very honored to have him with us. Mr. Duberstein, thank you for taking the time. Thanks a lot. Glad to be with you. Describe for me Ken Duberstein, the college student. Uh, what was he like and how did he spend his college years? I had took a, my first course in government uh -huh. in my second year, uh, Government 11. And I remember the professor getting up and saying to me, some people says, say the masses are asses, but we're going to spend the semester learning why the people usually get things the right way. And that intrigued me, and I fell in love with government and studying government as a result. I was a fraternity uh, man, uh, what do they call it, Greek now? Mm -hmm. um, I was active on a lot of student uh, organizations. Um, I was vice president of my fraternity. I played soccer. Um, I swam in a mural. And backstroke. Um, I had a great time at Franklin or Marshall College. I think the world of it. Uh, I am on their board. I've been on their board for a long time. Uh, and F and M, I think, is one of the real great private uh, schools in America. So you became interested in politics after taking that course, or when was it that you really decided that you wanted to go into government? Um, what intrigued me were my government courses, uh, especially that first one, but several of them. And the more I got into it, the more I said this is a passion of mine. One of my professors encouraged me to do an internship in Washington. I did not come from a very wealthy family. I applied for my home state senator at that time, Senator Javits of New York. And uh, my professor found $500 in grant money from the Pennsylvania Center for Education and Politics so that I would find $500 for living expenses for the summertime. And that's how I started my career, as a lowly summer intern. And yet I figured out early on that while an intern doesn't have much contact with a senator or a congressman, that I volunteered to drive the senator home at night. Okay. And that way, I didn't have a senior staffer saying, go away, kid, or go away, intern, that I had 15 minutes with the senator alone every night, every night. to talk in the car if he wanted to talk. And as a result, I got hired as a research assistant by Senator Javits, so I spent another year and a half with him. Year and a half with Senator Javits. Okay. So how did you come to work in the Ford administration? I had been in the Nixon administration Okay. Yeah, at the most unsexy of government agencies, GSA. GSA. Um, and yet it was a time during the Nixon impeachment stuff, the GSA was the custodian of the Nixon tapes and documents, okay. and of their, his homes at San Clemente, California, and Key Biscayne. And so I got to know a bunch of the White House people uh, working for Nixon, none of whom went to jail. <laughs> These were all good guys. Um, and I got to know an awful lot of people on Capitol Hill. In the Ford administration, uh, I was interviewed for a couple of big jobs, including at the White House in Congressional Liaison. And I remember not getting the job. And the reason why is that Jerry Ford was courting a United States Senator to support him for a re-election. And they gave it to his chief of staff, as then they used to call him administrative assistant. And I was devastated. And they asked me 
to go over to the Labor Department and interview with the then Secretary of Labor by the name of Bill Ussery, who was one of the foremost was one of the foremost labor mediators in the world. And he was from Milledgeville, Georgia, and I was from Brooklyn, New York. And we hit it off. And I became Deputy Undersecretary of Labor under Bill and Mike Moscow, who later went on to be Deputy USTR, was Deputy Secretary of Labor. And I spent a year at the Labor Department on their legislative program and their intergovernmental work. And I found that very rewarding. How did you find your way from Senator Chabot's office to the Nixon White House working in the GSA? I had contacts back in Pennsylvania uh -huh. uh, who knew that I was interested in going into the administration as under Nixon uh -huh. and wrote some letters and one of the places uh, that they contacted was GSA and the next thing I know I had an interview. So networking is all important and getting to know people and um, being friendly and open to people and knowledgeable and know that you can roll up your sleeves and get the job done. What in your view were the most important skills in, in dealing with Congress and working in congressional relations? Number one, you have to remember that they're elected and you're not. You have to remember that they answer their constituency and that constituency usually isn't the White House or the President. And you have to figure out a way to match the two of them. You have to make arguments that make sense to them so they can sell it back in their district. You have to make the arguments that your opposition will come and explain why they're wrong. You have to be available to them so that they feel like they can trust you as a resource. That you're not just selling them a bill of goods but this is something that will make a difference in the lives of their constituents that will ultimately help them get reelected. Uh, when did you meet uh, Ronald Reagan for the first time? I met Ronald Reagan, I, I think, for the first time. Uh -huh. um, after he was elected in 1980. Okay. I may have shook his hand someplace before that, but it was the first time I ever met with him uh -huh. was in transition in 1980 when I was being offered the job to head White House Legislative Affairs for the House of Representatives to take on Tip O'Neill uh, and the big Democratic majority in the House because Ronald Reagan realized that to be an effective president you have to have victories on Capitol Hill and he knew that so much of his program legislative program was going to have to originate in the House of Representatives, that somehow we had to figure out a way to win. And as you remember, it was usually successful in those first few years. Um, but I met him in 1980 in transition when they offered me the job. Okay. So the White House staff is, it composed largely of people who worked in the previous administration or worked on the campaign? It's an amalgamation of a lot of different talents. Uh -huh. You always have the, some of the people from the campaign. You also have people who are uh, experts in how to get things done in Washington. So for example, under President Reagan, Jim Baker is White House Chief of Staff. Jim was an expert in how to get things done in Washington. He was surrounded by people like me, Dick Darman, Dave Gergen, all of whom were practitioners of knowing what are the right buttons to push in Washington. But Ronald Reagan also had Mike Deaver, who was a very somebody very close to him and to Nancy Reagan, uh, who understood the communications function and where to place President Reagan in the best possible uh, way so that he would communicate to the American people. And Ed Meese, who had been with him in California, was the keeper of the torch, the so-called Reagan old philosophy, the conservative ideals and principles. 
those three were the triumvirate that led the White House. That kind of combination. Look, when you're governing, it's different talents than campaigning. When you campaign, you try to demolish your opponent. When you're governing, you have to say yes sometimes to your fiercest opponent and no to some of your strongest supporters. That's the art of compromise. What Ronald Reagan taught me and taught so many people is that government really is 80% solutions. Tip O'Neill used to say, I don't like compromising with Ronald Reagan because every time I compromise with him, Reagan gets 80% of what he wants. And President Reagan would say to me and others, I'll take 80% every time and I'll come back the next year for the additional 20. Isn't that what governing is all about? So as a leader, what kind of people did you enjoy working with the most? Number one, people who have great integrity. There are a lot of people who cut corners in this world. But people who have the highest integrity, who can look in the mirror and see themselves every day, that's important. I enjoyed people who understood that they didn't necessarily need FaceTime with the president just because they needed it or they wanted it, but it was based on what the president needed. It's the president's agenda that we were all there for, not any individual agendas. I enjoyed people who could take themselves not too seriously, but their job very seriously. I appreciated people who were willing to work around the clock, but had good judgment, who thought around corners, could see around corners. People who could anticipate the next three or four decisions down the road. You know, so many decisions come to the White House. If they get to the Oval Office, they must be very difficult, because if not, they should have been taken care of first. Before coming in. Before coming to the Oval Office. And that's part of the role of the Chief of Staff, but it's also the role of the whole White House staff. But when you give the President a decision, it's not just that decision, it's what are the ramifications that fall, flow from it. One of the things that I quickly realized, and maybe I realized beforehand, is that for every domestic decision, there is a foreign policy overlay. And for every foreign policy decision, there are domestic consequences. So you have to mesh everything together. Now, one of the people I enjoyed working with tremendously was Jim Baker. I learned an awful lot from him. And when I was chief of staff, he was secretary of the treasury. So we were always together. Another person who I enjoyed working with very much, when I was deputy chief of staff, he was Deputy National Security Advisor. And when I was Chief of Staff, he was the National Security Advisor. And his name was Colin Powell, uh, who has become one of my lifelong best friends. Uh, Colin grew up in the streets of the Bronx, New York. I grew up in the streets of Brooklyn, New York. And here we were, Chief of Staff to the President, National Security Advisor to the President only in America. Only America. Why did you end up leaving the Reagan administration after his first term? I enjoyed very much the legislative being in the forefront, and I knew that the campaign would interfere with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I helped on the campaign for that year, uh -huh. the, during the campaign year. Um, and then I wanted to honestly make some money and take a deep breath and get my life back together because you don't you don't have much of a life outside the White House. Um, and so I took a couple of years to make some money and I was not looking to go back to the White House. And President Reagan was not very happy with Don Regan who had been Chief of Staff and decided to fire him. And he offered the job 
to Howard Baker, a former Senate Majority Leader and a close friend of mine, who was a close friend of mine before he passed away. Howard was Mr. Integrity. He is the person who asked the famous question during Watergate hearings. What did the president know and when did he know it? He was a symbol of reestablishing trust and credibility to the Reagan White House because of what we were going through on Iran-Contra. Howard called me on, he had been uh, offered the job on a Friday night. He called me on Saturday and said, help. And he said, Ken, help. I've never managed anything before in my life. I've only been the Senate Majority Leader. Would you come in and be Deputy Chief of Staff and run the White House and the administration? And I said, Howard, you do a White House once, it's an honor. The second time, you're a glutton for punishment. I would rather prefer not to join. Ronald Reagan was at 37% in the polls. He was not only a lame duck, uh, some people said he was a virtual dead duck. Um, Two days later, I was giving a speech at the Capitol Hill Club, and somebody walked up to the lectern and handed me a note during my speech, and it was that the President Reagan's secretary was holding and insisting she hold for me. And I interrupted my speech, and Kathy Osborne said, the President wants to see you in the Oval Office at 2 o'clock that afternoon. And I walked into the Oval Office, and President Reagan got up from behind his desk and he said, Howard's told me all the reasons why you can't come back. I just want you to know one thing. Nancy and I want you to come home for the last two years of the administration. <laughs> and I said yes on the spot, and it was the best professional decision of my life. Wow. Um, and in those two years, We confirmed the Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. We got welfare reform done, Canada free trade done, the Berlin Wall speech, the strategic arms treaty with the Soviets, all 13 appropriation bills on time, which has only been done once since then. Not bad for a lame duck president and a B movie actor. But he left at 68% job approval, the highest job approval of any two-term president. But one of the things that was also key to him is President Reagan went before the American people and basically did a mea culpa. I do not think I was trading arms for hostages, but obviously the facts show that the government was involved in it for that I take responsibility. And people were willing to give the president a benefit of the doubt. Mia culpas from a president are rare. It usually is as bad as having 10 root canals. People want to trust the president. And if he says, I made a mistake, not too often, but if I made a mistake, they will then give him the benefit of the doubt. And that started the resurgence of Ronald Reagan. You talk about uh, the chiefs of staff, uh, Jim Baker, Howard Baker, and yourself, and then Don Regan. Um, what, looking back, did you all do differently from Don Regan that made you all more successful as chiefs of staff? We understood that we were staff, not chief. We understood that he was not the chairman of the board, or the retired chairman of the board, he was the CEO. We understood that it was his agenda, not somebody else's agenda. We understood that he thrived on an open door in the Oval Office, not a closed door where Don Regan was the only person in it who was allowed in. For students not familiar with the role of the White House Chief of Staff, what are the primary responsibilities of the Chief of Staff, and why is he so critical to the success of the President? Several people have described the job as the second toughest job in the world, or certainly in the United States. The job varies from President to President. 
as we've seen under President Trump now. Uh, he's had one, now he's had a, now with John Kelly is different. Uh, but he is the person who is charged with, he's in charge of the president's schedule. He's in charge of what goes to the Oval Office. He's in charge of speeches. Everything goes through the chief of staff's office. So it's all coordination. He is the person who's responsible for making sure that when the president makes a decision, everybody salutes and goes out and tries to sell it. He is the person who's the legislative strategist, who tries to figure out how we're going to get this past the Congress. What are the trade-offs that are necessary? He is the person who's coordinating with the cabinet officers on behalf of the president. He is the person who meets with the president, usually the first thing in the morning, and the last person he sees at night before he goes up to the residence. But the phone calls never stop. And you remember Hillary Clinton in 2008 when she was running for the presidency had that famous commercial, who do you want on the other end of the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning? The joke is, it's not the president. It's the chief of staff who gets awakened. And you decide whether to wake the president. That's the role. It's 24-7. And, you know, whenever the phone rings at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's never good news. And your job, they're not telling you this because you're, you're good looking. It's because you have to put into action the response of the United States government. So who are the people who have to be notified? Who are the people who need a conference call? Who are the people who need to start going forward on the mission, going forward? What was a more or less uh, typical day for you like as Chief of Staff? Well, there's no typical day in the life of a Chief of Staff, but uh, I usually got to the White House about 7.30 every morning. Um, I always read the President's Daily Intelligence Brief that a few of us receive. Um, I had my first meeting of the day usually was with Colin Powell or Frank Carlucci, uh, who first was uh, National Security Advisor. Uh, met with the President at 9 o'clock and then at 9.30 and then various times during the day when he was having meetings or I needed some direction from him or I wanted to share something with him. Um, you seldom left the White House campus uh, for anything social other than occasionally at nighttime. You didn't go out for lunch maybe once a month. Uh, everything that you're all consumed in, inside the bubble of the White House. And uh, I used to get home 10, 11 o'clock at night. 10, 11 o'clock at night. And it never, and the phone doesn't stop. Uh, you know, this is a this is before um, cell phones, so you had car phones. Uh, a cell phone was this big when they first came out, and I had one of the first ones in the White House because I was chief of staff. Um, and you think about the iPhones now, but this was like a brick. They call it a brick. Um, but um, there's no such thing as a typical day in the life of a White House Chief of Staff. Two more questions. What advice would you give to students about being a good leader? And what kind of skills should they be working on? To integrity, loyalty to a cause, and don't ever sell out your principles. And finally, students today are coming of age in quite a different political atmosphere and environment than 30 years ago. What would you tell students looking to enter public service and politics today? Do it. Do it. Public service is more necessary now than ever before. With all of the uh, partisanship mm -hmm. and all of the vitriol that comes, we have to have faith in our institutions of governing. We have to rebuild some of that faith. We're handing this torch off to your generation. 
please make America that much better. But institutions like, whether it's state or local or federal government, need the best and the brightest. It's committing yourself to a cause bigger than yourself. It's committing yourself to America. There's a reason why we're a shining city on a hill. We gotta keep it that way, we can't be tarnished. Yes, we're going through some problems. The partisanship is really ripping people apart. But there'll come a day where you can start building bridges again and not just erecting walls. Ronald Reagan was all about tearing down walls. That's one of the reasons why America loved him so much and maybe the world. Your generation has to continue that effort. We got to tear down barriers. We got to tear down some of these walls. And so our institutions, our government, our country can be much better off in the years and decades ahead. Mr. Duberstein, thank you very much. My pleasure.